chapter 16. What happened about the statues? What an extraordinary place, cried Lucy. All those stone animals, and people too. It's like a museum. Hush, said Susan. Aslan's doing something. He was indeed. He had bounded up to the stone lion and breathed on him. Then, without waiting a moment, he whisked around, almost as if he had been a cat chasing his tail, and breathed also on the stone dwarf, which, as you remember, was standing a few feet from the lion with his back to it. Then he pounced on a tall stone dryad, which stood beyond the dwarf, turned rapidly aside to deal with a stone rabbit on his right, and rushed on to two centaurs. But at that moment, Lucy said, Oh, Susan, look! Look at the lion! I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second, nothing seems to have happened. And then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. For a second after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back. Then it spread. Then the color seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over a bit of paper. Then, while his hindquarters were still obviously stone, the lion shook his mane, and all the heavy stone folds rippled into living hair. Then he opened a great red mouth, warm and living, and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life. He lifted one of them and scratched himself. Then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisking around him, whimpering with delight and jumping up to lick his face. Of course, the children's eyes turned to follow the lion, but the sight they saw was so wonderful that they soon forgot about him. Everywhere the statues were coming to life. The courtyard looked no longer like a museum. It looked more like a zoo. Creatures were running after Aslan and dancing round him till he was almost hidden in the crowd. Instead of all that deadly white, the courtyard was now a blaze of colors, glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of birds, reddy brown of foxes, dogs, and satyrs, yellow stockings and crimson hoods of dwarfs and the birch girls in silver, and the beach girls in fresh transparent green, and the larch girls in green so bright that it was almost a yellow. And instead of the deadly silence, the whole place rang with the sound of happy roarings, brayings, yelpings, barkings, squealings, cooings, neighings, stampings, shouts, hurrahs, songs, and laughter. Oh, said Susan in a different tone, look, I wonder, I mean, is it safe? Lucy looked and saw that Aslan had just breathed on the feet of the stone giant. It's all right, shouted Aslan joyously. Once the feet are put right, all the rest of him will follow. That wasn't exactly what I meant, whispered Susan to Lucy. But it was too late to do anything about it now, even if Aslan would have listened to her. The change was already creeping up the giant's legs. Now he was moving his feet. A moment later, he lifted his club off his shoulder, rubbed his eyes, and said, Bless me, I must have been asleep. Now, where's that ratted little witch that was running about on the ground? Somewhere just by my feet it was. But when everyone had shouted up to him, to explain what had really happened, and when the giant had put his hand to his ear and got them to repeat it all again so that at last he understood, then he bowed down till his head was no farther off the top of a haystack and touched his cap repeatedly to Aslan, beaming all over his honest, ugly face. Giants of any sort are now so rare in England, and so few giants are good-tempered, 
that ten to one you have never seen a giant when his face is beaming. It's a sight well worth looking at. Now for the inside of this house, said Aslan. Look alive, everyone. Upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber, leave no corner unsearched. You never know where some poor prisoner may be concealed. And into the interior they all rushed, and for several minutes the whole of that dark, horrible, fusty old castle echoed with the opening of windows and with everyone's voices crying out at once, Don't forget the dungeons! Give us a hand with this door! Here's another little winding stair. Oh, I say, here's a poor kangaroo. Call Aslan. Phew, how it smells in here. Look out for trap doors. Up here. There are a whole lot more on the landing. But the best of all was when Lucy came rushing upstairs, shouting out, Aslan, Aslan, I found Mr. Tumnus. Oh, do come quick. A moment later, Lucy and the little fawn were holding each other by both hands and dancing round and round for joy. The little chap was none the worse for having been a statue and was, of course, very interested in all she had to tell him. But at last, the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended. The whole castle stood empty with every door and window open and the light and the sweet spring air flooding into all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. The whole crowd of liberated statues surged back into the courtyard, and it was then that someone, Tumnus, I think, first said, But how are we going to get out? For Aslan had got in by a jump, and the gates were still locked. That'll be all right, said Aslan. And then, rising on his hind legs, he bawled up at the giant. Hi. You up there? he roared. What's your name? Giant Rumble Muffin, if it please your honor, said the giant, once more touching his cap. Well then, Giant Rumble Muffin, said Aslan, just let us out of this, will you? Certainly, your honor, it will be a pleasure, said Giant Rumble Muffin. Stand well away from the gates, all you letlands and then he strode to the gate himself, and bang, 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 went his huge club. The gates creaked at the first blow, cracked at the second, and shivered at the third. Then he tackled the towers on each side of them, and after a few minutes of crashing and thudding, both the towers and a good bit of the wall on each side went thundering down in a mass of hopeless rubble. And when the dust cleared, it was odd standing in that dry, grim, stony yard, to see through the gap all the grass waving trees and sparkling streams in the forest, and the blue hills beyond that, and beyond them, the sky. Blowed if I ain't all in a muck of sweat, said the giant, puffing like the largest railway engine. Comes a being out of condition. I suppose neither of you young ladies... Has such a thing as a pocket handkerchief about you? Yes, I have, said Lucy, standing on tiptoes and holding her handkerchief up as far as she could reach. Thank you, Missy, said Giant Rumble Buffin, stooping down. Next moment, Lucy got rather a fright, for she found herself caught up in mid-air between the giant's finger and thumb. But just as she was getting near his face, he suddenly started, and then put her gently back on the ground, muttering, Bless me, I've picked up the little girl instead. I beg your pardon, Missy, I thought you was the handkerchief. No, no, said Lucy, laughing. Here it is. This time he managed to get it, but it was only about the same size to him as a saturine tablet would be to you. And so, when she saw him solemnly rubbing it to and fro across his great red face, she said, I'm afraid it's not much use to you, Mr. Rumblebuffin. Not at all, not at all, said the giant politely. Never met a nicer handkerchief. So fine, so handy, so 
I don't know how to describe it. What a nice giant he is, said Lucy to Mr. Tumnus. Oh, yes, replied the fawn. All the buffins always were. One of the most respected of all the giant families in Narnia. Not very clever, perhaps. I never knew a giant that was. But an old family. With traditions, you know. If he'd been the other sort, she'd never have turned him into stone. At this point, Aslan clapped his paws together and called for silence. Our day's work is not yet over, he said. And if the witch is to be finally defeated before bedtime, we must find the battle at once. And join in, I hope, sir, added the largest of the centaurs. Of course, said Aslan. And now, those who can't keep up, that is, children, dwarfs, and small animals, must ride on the backs of those who can, that is, lions, centaurs, unicorns, horses, giants, and eagles. Those who are good with their noses must come out in front with us lions to smell out where the battle is. Look lively and sort yourselves. And with a great deal of bustle and cheering, they did. The most pleased of the lot was the other lion, who kept running about everywhere, pretending to be very busy, but really in order to say to everyone he met, Did you hear what he said? Us lions. That means him and me. Us lions. That's what I like about Aslan. No side. No standoffishness. Us lions. That means him and me. At least he went on saying this, till Aslan had loaded him up with three dwarves, one dryad, two rabbits, and a hedgehog. That steadied him a bit. When all were ready, it was a big sheepdog who actually helped Aslan the most in getting them sorted into their proper order. They set out through the gap in the castle wall. At first, the lions and dogs went nosing about in all directions. But then suddenly, one great hound picked up the scent and gave a bay. There was no time lost after that. Soon all the dogs and lions and wolves and other hunting animals were going at full speed with their noses to the ground, and all the others, streaked out for about half a mile behind them, were following as fast as they could. The noise was like an English fox hunt, only better, because every now and then, with the music of the hounds, which mix the roar of the other lion, and sometimes the far deeper and more awful roar of Aslan himself. Faster and faster they went, as the scent became easier and easier to follow, and then, just as they came to the last curve in a narrow winding valley, Lucy heard above all these noises another noise, a different one, which gave her a queer feeling inside. It was a noise of shouts and shrieks, and the clashing of metal against metal. Then they came out of the narrow valley, and at once she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund, and all the rest of Aslan's army, fighting desperately against the crowd of horrible creatures whom she had seen last night. Only now, in the daylight, they looked even stranger, and more evil, and more deformed. There also seemed to be far more of them, Peter's army, which had their backs to her, looked terribly few, and there were statues dotted all over the battlefield, so apparently the witch had been using her wand. But she did not seem to be using it now. She was fighting with her stone knife. It was Peter she was fighting, both of them going at it so hard that Lucy could hardly make out what was happening. She only saw the stone knife and Peter's sword flashing so quickly that they looked like three knives and three swords. That pair were in the center. On each side the line stretched out. Horrible things were happening everywhere she looked. Off my back, children, shouted Aslan, and they both tumbled off. Then with a roar that shook all Narnia, from the western lamp post to the shores of the eastern sea, the great beast flung himself upon the white witch. Lucy saw her face lifted towards him for one second with an expression of terror 
and amazement. Then the lion and the witch had rolled over together, but with the witch underneath. And at the same moment, all warlike creatures whom Aslan had led from the witch's house rushed madly on the enemy lines. Dwarfs with their battle axes, dogs with their teeth, the giant with his club, and his feet also crushed dozens of the foe. Unicorns with their horns, centaurs with swords and hooves. And Peter's tired army cheered, and the newcomers roared, and the enemy squealed and gibbered till the wood re-echoed with the din of that onset.'"